presence, my life. Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me. Good morning and welcome to Word of Grace. It's great to have you here this morning. Um, thankfully, church is open once again, as we've been mentioning, and that you are able to come out. We're thankful that you are coming out to hear the Word, to worship together, and to fellowship. It's just something that we recognize over these past couple of months was really missing in our lives. And uh, For me, I know it's, it's far more intense just because of not having been able to come out and with the body of Christ and enjoy just uh, worshiping God with you. So we're thankful for that. So we're going to begin with a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you're doing in our midst. Thank you that for all you're doing in our hearts. Lord, we love you today. We praise you. We just give you this morning and we ask that your blessing would fill up everything that lacks, Lord, that we would be completely sustained and fulfilled by your presence today, by your word. And you would visit us that we might experience more of you in our lives, Lord. And you might give us definition of how we can bring greater levels of glory to you. So we pray, Lord, you'd ask, we ask that you would bless your word. We give you this, this time now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Well, I... It's hard not to have um, perhaps the events of this week on our hearts as we see the country in tremendous turmoil and some maybe many visions, uh, pictures on television that you never thought you would see in your lifetime. I never thought I would see in my lifetime. And, um, but whenever circumstances happen in the nation, I always look and try to listen to what God might be saying to the church what he might be saying to me. Um, and we see in Christianity, perhaps as in the Old Testament in the book of Judges, there are cycles of sin that a nation can go through as Israel went through, um, cycles of sin that cause people to drift from God, wander from God, um, enter into idolatry, um, enter into the consequences of that idolatry, and then seek God for deliverance, and then again, once again, experience his deliverance, his provision, and his restoration. And um, 
it's not something that we have to go through, but I think we experience it on a personal level as well as a national level. And um, I pray that we would be in that place of repentance on a, on a daily basis, that we would be seeking God and His will for our lives, and we would learn how to judge ourselves. I was thinking um, in the book of Joshua how there were three major military campaigns involving more than 30 different enemies that Joshua had to um, deal with. And they were victorious. There was this crucial, the crucial lesson that was learned in Joshua that victory comes through faith in God and obedience to his word, rather than military might or numerical superiority. And many of us can see our country could very well be at a tipping point. And how would we even begin to see godly people prevail? How do we even begin to see the church, which ultimately is under attack, how would we see it overcome and experience a victory? And it's the same way it's been from the beginning. Victory comes through faith in God and obedience to his word, rather than military might or numerical superiority. And Joshua learned this lesson, that they had to obey, they had to uh, live according to the word of God. And then we see the, the next book, in the scriptures, the book of Judges, and what a tremendous contrast, because disobedience and idolatrous people um, <clears throat> entered into this phase where they had left God uh, because they didn't fully drive out the Canaanites in the country they were in. Um, they began to fellowship with them, they began to intermarry with them, and we, we see a, an incredible picture, but um, this disobedience caused them to enter into rebellion against God. And because there was not a complete conquest, um, corruption from within resulted and oppression from without. So enemies were raised up, we see, that began to truly plague the nation of Israel as they left God. And well, what, do, what do the Canaanites rep represent? They don't really represent people um, that are against God, necessarily, they could, but we see Canaan as a type of the flesh. And of course we know Noah's son Ham had a son Canaan, and it was, he was considered the child of the flesh. So what happened was, in the book of Judges, because the Canaanites were not driven out, because we didn't address ourselves, we didn't judge our flesh, we didn't judge completely, who we were outside of Christ and entered into some level of disobedience, some level of idolatry, the, the Canaanites began to have a greater influence in the lives of the people. And we see that um, <clears throat> they began by living with the Canaanites and how easy it is to live with our flesh. How easy it is to say, well, just gonna, we're, we're not going to drive it out. We're not going to crucify it. We're not going to um, over overcome it through the cross, but we're somehow going to cohabitate with our flesh. So the flesh gets its way on certain occasions, and then when it's time to be spiritual, we become more spiritual. And so what happens is this is really a major conflict, and I'm not saying the conflict is always bad, because at least we know we have Christ living in us attempting to overcome the flesh. But we need to recognize that this flesh has to be driven out completely. There has to be a complete conquest of it, because as long as we try to live our lives cohabiting with the flesh, it's, it's going to always be warring, always be, as we see in Galatians 5, lusting against the spirit, and trying to conquer the spirit and cause us to live according to the flesh. So they, they somehow learned to live with, the Israelites learned to live with the flesh in the book of Judges, and, and they entered into this war with it, and ultimately they were living like the flesh. So the flesh reached a point where it ultimately maintained control and domination over the spiritual lives of the people, which is what caused them to enter into disobedience and idolatry. And now we, you and I can be subject to the same um, cycle at, in our walk with the Lord. And we need to, to recognize this and uh, discern it. And this is the purpose of the Word of God. The Word of God... Uh, tells us in Hebrews 4.12 that it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It judges. It judges us. The Word of God judges our thoughts. It judges our hearts. And you and I need a judge. 
And it's interesting because when a judge was raised up in the book of Judges, people honored God. But when the judge passed away, when there was a gap between judges in the book of Judges, people readily entered into disobedience and idolatry. So I don't know about you, but I know in my life I need to walk with a judge. I need to know that there is a judge that exists that I'm accountable to. There, there, there's a judge called the Word of God, and the, and the Word's not sent, sent to condemn me, but to give me discernment, to help me to understand my own, my own heart. I mean, the, the Bible tells us to examine ourselves in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let us examine ourselves. Um, it, it says in first, uh, verse 31 of 1 Corinthians 11, if we judge ourselves, if we judge ourselves, which means to separate thoroughly, to oppose, to discern, to evaluate, if we evaluate ourselves based on the criteria of the Word of God, we would not be judged. And that word means to, to punish. So if I, I live a life where I'm consistently in the Word of God, performing that self-diagnosis, that self-evaluation, self-examination, then I can correct the course of my life. But without the Word of God, how do I ever begin to correct the course of my life? It's a little bit like driving a car. Do you know how many times you move the steering wheel when you're driving the car down the road? You don't even know you're doing it. It becomes unconscious. But you're always correcting the course of your car. Because if you don't, obviously there are consequences to not correcting the course. You've got to follow the road. It's really no different in the Word of God. I need to have a steady input of every word that proceeds from the mouth of God into my heart, or my course is not corrected. And as a result, I find myself heading for things and in directions that are contrary to God's will for my life. And, and so we need to understand how crucial it is to examine ourselves. Um, the judges were chosen by God to rescue the people from their enemies and establish justice. And so I too need this judge. I need this word of God in my, in that, that represents the, the authority for my life. And without this authority, um, you see what takes place in the world. And, and I don't want to blame every, all the events that are taking place on Christianity, but but Christianity is always on some level responsible for what takes place. Maybe not uh, pure Christianity, but the fall, falling away, because every man is in a different level of cycle. Every person is in a different phase of that cycle. Um, do you know the cycle? Israel serves the Lord. Israel falls into idolatry. Israel is enslaved. Israel cries out to the Lord. God raises up a judge, and then Israel is delivered. And this is the cycle that we can, we can all enter into. I'd rather not go through a cycle. I'd rather follow him every single day, examine myself, let him correct my course, uh, be on my face before him, live in obedience, and just allow the Holy Spirit to, to rule and dominate my flesh and fully drive out the Canaanites of my own personal life and experience the fullness of his call on my life. And I think this is our heart's desire for every one of us, that we want to honor Him more and more every single day as we mature in our walk, mature in the faith, in a way that truly brings great glory to Him. So let's just consider these thoughts and, and uh, close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank You for Your steadfast love this morning. We thank You that we don't have to enter into this cycle of sin, but we can, we can immediately remove ourselves from it the moment we repent. The moment we look to you, and Lord, we want to walk in this consistent walk, in a walk of stability, in a walk of faithfulness to you, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, for your church, for all of us, Lord, that we would continue to honor you through your strength, through your power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good work, Pastor Steve. We are in the book, long awaited with a long preamble. We'll still have an intro to Revelation, but we are at Revelation. Um, still studying it, still reading it again and again. Still amazed at the magnitude and the wisdom of God to put this book at the end of the Bible. It is the end of things. 
really in chapter 22. It is the ultimate for you. Uh, it is finished and finished work, people. The real finished work is in 22.6 where Jesus says, it is finished. 21.6. It is finished. Uh, it is all done. It is the end of all the plan of God for the redemption of humanity. It is the real finished work that we look at. He did everything he could uh, on the cross when he said it is finished in John 19, but the real finish of the completion of the work, uh, it is finished in Revelation 21. Uh, great, great words, great thoughts. Uh, it starts out in Genesis, the beginning of things, and it is the end of things in the book of Revelation. Um, it is the final conclusion of all things, and he calls himself, one of the major titles of God in this book is he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning of the end. Paul writes in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 that he's the author and the what? The finisher. This is the finishing of it all. This is something that through the ages all mankind since the fall has looked for. Since the dawning of sin, the killing of Cain, the blood on the ground crying out, all mankind has looked for God to come and make all things new, all things right. And this is it. And we rapidly approach this age, and this age has been looked from the prophets. Again, we did a great survey of Matthew 24, looking at Jesus uh, validating this time period, uh, that he would be the magnification of all things at the end. Remember, his first coming, we find the tremendous humiliation. We preached the message a few months ago on uh, Philippians chapter 2, the mind of Christ being within us and the exaltation of Christ, that every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God and the Father. Philippians 2 talks about that. When we look at the scriptures, we find no book like this in all the scriptures, Old or New Testament. We find referrals to it, but we find none in the great mystery of God. We find that the book of Revelation is the exaltation, finally, the exaltation of the humble Lamb of God. When we look at the Gospels and we look at, at the life that Jesus lived with a direction one way, like a flint towards the cross in Isaiah 57, we see him in his humiliation. I mean, he was born into a world, leaving heaven. He, he who was rich, the scriptures talk about, became poor. He also was born what? The minute he was born in a manger, a place for animals to be grazed and lay. There was no room for him in the world. Uh, he was threatened with his life from beginning to end. He had to flee into Egypt. We have the slaying of the innocents in the beginning gospel story. We have him coming back out of that after the death of Herod. We have him moving to Nazareth, uh, a place that was in great repute and uh, was very, very uh, seen as a very poor place to live. In fact, the Pharisees would say, could any good thing come out of this place called Nazareth? He was great in that. He was a prophet out of Galilee, so was Jonah. When they said there was no prophet out of Galilee, there was Jonah with a mission to the Gentiles. Even though he didn't want to go, he went. And he caused the greatest revival we talked about last week uh, in the Minor Prophets of all the Old Testament. The whole city of Nineveh came to Christ. After also a great shaking, by the way. An earthquake hit Nineveh before that time period. Uh, there was great turmoil uh, in the city of Nineveh. And then the prophet of God came and uh, led them to the Lord. He is greater than Jonah. And he leads men to Christ. He was born, finally his ministry starts 30 AD, or 30 years old, let's say, and he sets his flint all the way through his miraculous uh, life to authenticate his messiahship, fulfilling the prophecies, doing miracles, signs and wonders, uh, which wasn't the substance of who he was. He could do those things, but he wanted to reveal who he was. His love, his kindness, his mercy. It's the revealing of the nature of God in a man, the God-man. And he goes all the way, Philippians, back to Philippians 2, where we started this. 
He humbled himself, he emptied himself, it talks about. In other words, his glory, who he was, he emptied it out and put himself in the form of a man, and he was humble. And even, the Bible says, to the most humiliating place to be, the death of the cross, where you're stripped naked, beat, and hung out on a road in public, on the, on the intersection of two roads, near the road that all could see. In fact, if, if it is where uh, Gordon says it is, it would be on a hill overlooking. You would ride by so everybody could see. It was on the hill of Golgotha. And there were two intersection sections right there, main travel fairs, and you would be up there for all to see your humiliation and your nakedness. There he hung. Now, for that, Every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. The only book that really glorifies Jesus Christ like that is the book of Revelation. It is the exalting of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the removing of the veil of all the humiliation to see the one who did it. As one preacher, and I still remember his words, Luther writes, he was a missionary to West Africa, old missionary. And he talked about Philippians 2, and he said, he, he shouted out like a preacher should. He said, the spotless Lamb of God, humiliated for me, but never to be humiliated again. Never to be humiliated again. The book of Revelations is that book that all Christians should read. It is a book of blessing for all that read it. In fact, it starts out with a book, uh, a word of blessing to the reader, and it also ends with a book, uh, with a word of blessing to the reader. From front to back, it is about blessing for me to read it. The number one theme, again, is the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the titles of the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation, and there are more titles than any other book about who he is, and the, the titles declare uh, what he has done. First of all, he's called the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth. He's called the first and the last. He who lives, he's the Son of God, holy and true, the Amen and the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, a lamb, faithful and true, the word of God, king of kings and lord of lords, alpha, omega, the bright and morning star, and the Lord Jesus Christ. His titles, and they are only some of them, go on through to reveal what the Holy Spirit is revealing to us in the, in the book of Revelation. Uh, it is a book that really is, it's very peculiar, there was a poll taken recently of this book, and it is the number one books that most pastors don't preach. It's the most unpreached book in the entire Bible. And yet when polled of, of parishioners, it is the number one book that people want to hear. I mean, that's kind of a contrast uh, in some kind of uh, understanding of like, well, how does that happen and why is that so? Uh, many people stay away from the book of Revelations because it's misunderstood. I'm actually listening to my old David Jeremiah's uh, tapes and he's like, the book of Revelation, if you read it, it is the easiest book to read in the scriptures. Now, I, I don't know if that's true, but he backs it up in his idea that it is a book that is given an outline at the beginning and it's also a book that all most of the symbols that are given are also explained in the book and if not they're explained in the old testament it is a book that is clear if you study it if you read it it's a book that most christians don't want to read misunderstood wise they may want to hear things that tickle their ear but they don't want to read it because they don't think it has any practical value in fact, Luther himself really uh, thought the uh, book of Revelation had no real value 
in it and very little value. Let's say that he wouldn't go as far as saying none, but he said very little because it doesn't talk about Christ. I don't even know how Luther could say that since the whole book is about Christ. But he later on he kind of changed that around a little bit like Drew Brees, I guess maybe in his statement about the flag. He changed that back around and, and gave a little more tolerance to the book. But it's a book like we said through this whole thing when we talk about the rapture, we talk about the end times. A lot of these doctrines weren't even strong because they weren't relevant. But the book of Revelation has always been relevant in the sense that all through the scriptures, backing it up, it's about the end. We're all looking for the end, and we'll all find the end, whether we go feet first or head first. Preferably be head first, but if I go feet first, the end is always near for me. It's always a breath away. And the end will be there, and the glorification of Christ and His church are part of that, are all of that, really. The main thing is to, for us as believers is to fall in love again and again with Jesus Christ that we might be his bride, we might be his church, we might be his called out one. I am my beloved, he is mine. We might be all of that. And that we might be there on that day and be pleasing to him. That the end of Song of Solomon might be true for me that his desire is towards me. I am my beloved and his desire is towards me. It is for the making ready of the bride. And this book has always been relevant for history, like we said in the waves and waves of the hurricane of tribulation that go through the centuries. This has always been a place for saints to find refuge in the sense in the middle of real severe persecution, they draw strength from this book, thinking the end was near. The end is always near. I mean, if that's not made quickly, when the Lord said, the true, when the Lord says, Behold, at the end of this book, he says, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let all that hear it say, Come. When he says, Behold, I come quickly. And that's, in our timetables, I was accused of being two minutes late today. 2,000 years is a little bit really late. I know. 2,000 years are a little bit really late for quickly. That's a slow boat to China and beyond. But he comes quickly in his timetable. And he does not live in time. He inhabits eternity. He actually is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. That shows you that he inhabits eternity. In his mind, and his will, it's already happened, and it is happening, and it will happen. That's who God is. He's the past, the present, and the future. He's eternity. And he inhabits that all. So I want to read some of this book to begin with and give some background as we go. There's a blessing for reading it. There's also a blessing for hearing it. So I thought we'd start out with reading the, the first chapter, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, many times in this book, it's called the revelation of John the Divine. The early church had that, or the Catholic Church through the centuries. And uh, it really starts out, that's not inspired by God, by the way, because titles aren't expired that we put on books. But the book gives its revelation who it is from the very first sentence. It says it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is the apocalypse. It is apocalyptic writing. It is the strongest word, and we've taught this, it is the strongest word of parousia, epiphany. It is the strongest word that can be used for a revealing for our opening up and showing things that aren't clearly seen. It is showing God through the centuries and then through His Son on earth and things that are hidden, but finally it's opened up. It parallels the book of Daniel, which we, we touched on last week also. We touched on the uh, Daniel 9, and we can touch on the whole book of Daniel as a prophetic writing, but it is a book that Daniel talks about at the end of his book in chapter 12, the angel to Daniel says, listen, take the book and seal it for a time of times. This book, it ends in 20, 20 and 21 where the angel says to John, he says, listen, he says, take the book and don't seal it. Open it up that all can see the revelation of Jesus Christ and what he's done to buy it through his own blood is clear and needs to be heard by all. His victory needs to be 
proclaimed. His hope needs to be unveiled. That is true. And it comes quick. And no matter what I go through now, the truth of it is more real than anything we see with the eye on this earth. Behold, he comes quickly. So he is the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is about his complete exaltation. And if anything we get out of the book, we need to exalt Jesus Christ. You want to please him? You need to worship him. You need to be in love with him, because he loved you first. In 1 John 4. We love him because he loved us first. I need to be outrageously in love with him. Outrageously. This book is meant for you to be outrageously in love with him. And not to lose that first love. Like the church of Ephesus, which we'll read about in chapter 2. Which is the greatest sin of the church. Which means it's the greatest sin of the believer. To lose their first love. You can do all the good things in the world, be a good person, social worker, all that thing. It means nothing to God without love. As Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 13, without love I am what? Nothing. Without the love of God in my heart, from Him and to Him, everything else doesn't matter. Nor is He pleased. It's a book about love. It is a revelation, the unveiling of my great lover in the sky my father my bride and the holy spirit the trinitarian god which god gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place again this is written about in the 80s 86 of the domitian uh, a long time ago but they must shortly take place we all should believe that and it's all like, again, you've got to go context. As Paul writes in chapter 4 and 5 of Thessalonians, you have to believe context. That, listen, the dead that die will not be like waiting. They will be there. They'll not be waiting. That We won't mourn like they're going to sit in the ground. Paul clarifies that in 2 Corinthians 5. The die is to be one, present with the Lord. There is no waiting in God. God is immediately straightway, and the eternal is. These things will shortly take place for anyone who has ever lived. And he said and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads, and those who hear the words of this prophecy, to keep those things which are written in it, for the time is again near. <laughs> John to the seven churches which are in Asia Minor. Grace, peace from him who is and was and who is to come, and from his seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us, there is the first love, and washed us, from our sins to his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever this is a book about being born again and, and it only is can I say this it's only real to those who know God and are born again and washed in the blood how are you how are you born again you're washed in the blood of the lamb when Daniel writes his book his prophetic book he based Hold on. We get reception in the church. There we go. The curse of technology. When he writes his book, Daniel, in chapter 12, he says, he says this, Listen, the wicked will not understand this book, Daniel says. The wicked will not understand it. But the wise, they'll understand the same meaning here with Revelation. The only way you understand this, and this is the first hermeneutical rule, you got to be saved. you got to have a light on in the room to read it. you got to have the Holy Spirit in your heart to light up your soul, that you walk in light. You won't understand it. You won't care to understand it. You will trivialize it. You will make it a book of, of symbols, and, you know, it's, it's about the end and all this yin and yang that goes in, and 
has no real relevance, so why do I want to waste my time reading a book that has no real relevance on my soul? Uh, the exaltation of Jesus Christ, the magnification of the glory of God, I think has relevance in anyone's life, except for those that will not see it, nor be part of it. It's a great opportunity, it's a great life, it's a great whatever you want to put as a metaphor, to enter into the life that God died for you to live. To live in His glorification, that He will glorify you. If I blow up Him, He loves me, because He first loved me, it's because I received it. If I glorify Him, uh, He will what? Glorify me. He will make me something magnificent, which He wants to make all His church. But i got to be born again to begin that whole part of this revelation and new creation. He is the Lord, and He washed us in the blood of the Lamb. He is the faithful witness. He is the ruler of the kings. He has dominion. Behold, I love this, He comes in the clouds, reading back at seven. And every eye will see him, and all those who pierced him, and the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and is to come, Almighty. I, John, the brother your companion, tribulation, the kingdom, patience of the Lord Jesus Christ, was on the Isle of Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. This is Spirit filled. The writer of this is John. The revelation is from the Spirit of the living God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Father and the triune God is in the midst of this. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, which means the day we worship. It would have been on Sunday. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, in Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos, and Thyatira, and Sardis, and Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed in a garment, down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden, golden band. His head and hair were white as wool as white as snow, and his eyes like flames of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell down at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Write these things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars which are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Father, just bless these words and I pray the blessings, the blessings of this book would be rich and would be full and that you would impart them to your saints that hear these words. Lord, we need a blessing in these perilous times. I pray that the teaching of your word will do that. One of the reasons that I think David Jeremiah says this is one of the easiest books is because the Holy Spirit gives the outline in the book to begin with. He gives the outline in the sense that he talks about the makeup of the book in three parts. And the three parts are basically what he sees in chapter 1, the vision of God. Number two, he goes from chapter 2 to 19 with what will, what is now. In other words, he talks about the idea of the churches. In other words, he has a vision of God, what is, what's happening now, 
which will be what he's speaking to the churches, the seven churches which he pastors. One of the datings of this book, and there's a debate on that, in the idea that some people would like to use it, that the book of Revelations has already been filled, fulfilled. The argument of that is the dating of the book. It would have to be dated at the time of Nero. But one of the arguments of the book is that the Apostle John, remember, who pastored the church and founded it was Paul. And then Timothy, late at the end of Paul's life, which were the late 60s AD. And then for John to take control of these churches, to have the influence over these churches, to be sent to Patmos, and to write to these churches has to be a, a period of some time. If I take it at the dating of Nero, it would be before the what? Before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And that would uh, not do justice to the writing here, where he is a leader and seen as the apostle over all the churches in Asia Minor. Not all are mentioned here. This is a circular mention. In fact, it goes clockwise as he mentions them, almost like the times that come quickly, like a clock. It goes counter. It goes clockwise around the Lycia Valley like a clock into mentioning the seven churches. There's churches not mentioned. Colossians isn't isn't mentioned. Uh, I, I think it's Hypothelus is a church that mentioned in the scriptures. It's not mentioned. So all the churches that Paul founded and writes to aren't mentioned in this book of Revelation. They exist, but they're not mentioned. He makes it like a clock in time periods. One of the things you saw here is the use of the number seven, which is the key idea of the symbolic language of the book. It is meant to be symbolic. We'll get into that. But he gives an outline of his vision in chapter 1 of what is happening now in the seven churches. And then he goes into what will happen. From 4 on, he talks about what will happen. And then in what will happen, he'll end, he'll end that in chapter 19. Then he picks up in 20 with what the glorification of what will happen of Jesus Christ. The full glorification. In other words, he'll come back. And he'll make all things new. He'll rule on the earth. And then he'll consummate all things in chapter 22 with the new heavens and earth, which will roll away after the millennial thousand year reign of Christ on the earth. But it is a book that is outlined from the very beginning from the Holy Spirit. What he sees in the vision of God, what he's going to say to the seven churches which are now, and what he's going to say, what's going to happen, and then what's going to finally say what will happen at the end glorification of Jesus Christ. Outlined by the Holy Spirit. No reason for an outline of men. God already did it. And so easily to understand, yeah, God gives you an outline. You don't have to ponder over what is the outline of the book. He has given it. It is a book that really talks about the idea of the revelation and it's going to be a prophetic book. It's going to declare from the very beginning that it is a prophetic book, that this is a prophecy given in verse 3, the words of the prophecy, and it's the only prophetic book in the New Testament, that it is a prophecy, a book of prophecy given by God. It's going to end the book. And this is important too, because when we look at viewpoints, which we'll touch on, because there are four major viewpoints on this, a lot of them, this is important because a lot of people don't believe this is a prophetic book. That this is, some believe it's a symbolic book of the struggle of good and evil to the end. Some people believe it's already happened. They believe Israel has already fulfilled its fullness and the land it's got from David. They believe that the tribulation happened under Nero. And these were words to the church. They don't want to believe in this book for the future or in a dispensational point of view that this is a time period. They don't want to believe in dispensations. We believe in dispensations. We clarify what we believe in that. God's still the same today and forever from beginning to end. He's never changed. We're supposed to change in the progressive revelation of God like I have a pro progressive revelation on the book of Revelation. But I hold true to what I believe and what I've been taught, but what I've also studied, that this book is futuristic and dispensational, that it gives me time periods that will happen, what have happened, 
I also believe it's written this way in the symbolic form to give us what? To give us clarity in any generation, even in generations where we have predominantly ignorant people that understood symbols more than they would understand words and theology. I don't have to be a theologian to understand it. I can take the symbols, they have meaning to this. When you tell me a beast is coming after me, I kind of understand that's not a good thing. In any time frame I live in, I got to understand that. I don't have to be a scholar to figure out who the beast is and, and when he's coming and it's a computer. I know I need to be afraid of that thing because beasts kind of chew you up, spit you out. I kind of understand. I kind of understand what death is when he rides on a pale horse. I understand what, what God is when he comes back on a horse, Jesus Christ, a white horse, not no longer a donkey, that I understand the humiliation in that one scene that he doesn't come back as a humble Lamb of God. He did that. He gave time to minister in age of grace and his hand stretched out, but now he comes back not with the right hand of grace, but with the left hand of judgment. Now he comes back on a horse. Now he comes back with an army in white, very clean, very clean, white. And he leads them, and in one second, he ends the rebellion of the earth, and he reigns. This is about his exaltation. And you know, he, he is magnified in here, and you know what, it is a book, as I said, to start this little disarray right now, that is, is timeless and is meant to be timeless that every generation, remember, God's not just not writing to me. We live in an existential world that it's all about me now. I like to believe it's, it's about me, but it's also about those that lived at, at 70 AD and 80 AD and the Middle Ages. I'd like to believe for all the horror in, world, in the world, people could look at this and think maybe God's coming, maybe God's coming. He said he's coming quickly. Why not me? I could believe in, in the Holocaust, you know, during the, the killing of the Jews, how many Christians believed the time was coming, that Adolf Hitler was the Antichrist. There's been Antichrist in Paul. John writes that more than anybody in his epistles. Antichrists have come. There are Antichrists in the world. There's always been the waves of the, the hurricane spinning and stronger and stronger. And the strongest one has been in the lifetimes of many in the persecution of the Jews and the founding of the homeland. He's still coming very quickly. Now can I say he's coming quicker than he did 2,000 years ago? No one's waited more, I'll say it again and again, no one's waited more than their lifetime to see the Lord Jesus Christ magnified in glory. He sits in heaven in glory. He left it. His second advent will be one that he'll come back, not veiled, but completely Apocalypse completely unveiled in all his glory, in all his majesty, in all his power, in all his glory, he'll come back. And as a believer, we need to draw near this, we need to understand this, and we need to rejoice in its coming. As a believer, I need to make myself ready. As a believer, I need to make myself, like any bride would be seen, fruitful ready to bear fruit, bearing fruit, fruitful in virtue, fruitful in productivity, fruitful, the virtuous women and beyond. I need to be like that as I make myself ready that he is my friend. I need to be a friend of Jesus. I love that. I bought with a price of not my own. I am my beloved, he is mine. But you know what? I need to progress into that, and I need to know Jesus. I need to know who He is in this book more than any other book. This is who He really is. He laid it down to be the Lamb of God, but He picks it up again to be the exalted King of kings and Lord of lords. I need to know who He is in this book. This is the lover of my soul. He's not poor. All things are His. He's not weak. He's the mighty God. I love Isaiah 9, 6, when it gives you a glimpse of this. Unto us, a child is born. Yeah, a child was born, but a son was given. And his name shall be called 
wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He is revealed in all those things in this book, in the government being upon his shoulders from 3, from 4 to 19. It's about the governments of the world. And finally, the government completely on his shoulder in the millennial reign of Christ. It's all revealed in this book. And I need to be his friend, and I need to look for that day. Behold, he comes in the clouds. I love that statement. And you should look at clouds. I look at clouds all the time. I said, I, I can still, whenever I see glorious clouds, I stand there and stare at them like I would at mountain peaks. And I say, wouldn't that be a great cloud to come back in? Amen. He will come in the clouds, and all will see him in his glory. It won't have to be delayed broadcast. All will see him in his second advent. And behold, he comes. It is a book beyond all books. It is a book that needs to be read. It is a book that in many ways is very, very mysterious in a sense. And we don't want, when we read this, we don't want the symbols to daunt us. Again, many of the symbols in this book are the idea that they are explained. If you read it, they are explained when they're, when they're written. Even in the first chapter, we see explanations to the word. Look at verse 4. Grace be to and peace from our God and Father. I love that it uses all Pauline titles here to start it. Grace and peace to you, the foundations of the Christian walk. That God has given me grace and he wants me to have peace. Who is and was and is to come. And from his seven spirits who are before his throne. From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. He is giving ideas of this word seven, which is going to be the predominant idea of the book. But he's going to tell us that what that these books in the seven are what that the seven look at verse 11 he's the alpha and the omega what do you see right in the book and send to the seven churches which are asia smyrna and thyat seven again there he goes and talks about the midst of the seven candlesticks in verse 13 the close of the son of man and then he begins and he, he explains these things to us that they are what they are. The seven stars you see at my right hand in verse 20. In these sevens, I don't have to wonder. The mystery of the seven stars which are at my right hand and the seven golden lamp lampsticks. The seven stars are what? The seven angels of the seven churches or messengers. They could be pastors, by the way. A little, little upgrade for pastors. I could be an angel in disguise. The word's messenger. But he's writing them to be read by pastors in a church, not just angels. Again, honor what God honors. I am not worthy of any honor, but God says honor because the word of God comes forth. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven church, and the seven lampstands which you saw are what? The seven churches. There's symbolic things, but explained. The seven lampstands are the churches, and the seven stars are what? The messengers, the angels, the pastors. All are true in that place. They're going to be written and understood. The symbolicness of this, and this is the idea of this book, there's not one Old Testament mention when we talk about prophecy, though it's a big book of prophecy. There's not one direct mention, and this is the only prophetic book in the New Testament, but there are 404 references to the Old Testament, not direct, not quoted, as Isaiah said, as you see Jesus, the prophet Isaiah said this, this the Psalms say this, it's not quoted, but the rec references, they're inferred and they apply. 275 of them to Old Testament prophetic of the unveiling in the Old Testament. 275 go back. Now, one of the ideas of this is why did he use symbolic reading? A lot of it he is going to define just like he did there, which are hard to understand. Some of it he did not. Some of it was understood. Remember, we're talking about an age that didn't have what video games online whatever you want to watch tv with a billion channels we live in an age which which is so dangerous because we live in an age that in 1984 when that book was written which was a philosophic of the end times of the world basically 
Big Brother watching, the idea was like Hitler burning books, that they were going to burn books and deny you from reading books. When Adolf Huxley wrote A Brave New World, it was the idea that we're going to give you so much information that you can't figure out what's going on. Who's on first, what's on second? We live in that kind of age. That we have so much information that we just want to read the cliff notes of everything and never get any bread and butter or meat and potatoes out of what we read. This book was meant to be read. And when it was written, it was written under the age of Domitian, which was a persecution against Jesus Christ. Domitian was the first one who realized that the, the, the proclamation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ was an attack against Rome. He was the first Roman emperor to make and declare himself God. And he warred upon the saints in the idea against Jesus Christ being God. And he declared himself God. And emperor worship to the maximum. And he had a ten year persecution of what? And he writes about 10 years in the church of Smyrna. He had a 10-year persecution which was relevant against the churches. Number one, against the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't persecute churches without persecuting Jesus Christ, by the way. You can't be persecuted without Jesus being persecuted. That's Paul's revelation on the Damascus Road in Acts 9. When the Lord says, Paul, Paul, why do you persecute thou me. Why do you persecute thou me? It is a book of hope with an image of God and a revelation of God for John, but a word of hope for now. It's always a word for now. Now. And he writes to them in a great letter of the Antichrist coming to what? Destroy. Yeah. And he writes it in the sense that, uh, there Jeremiah talks about the idea that he writes this in the sense of a code, which when you read it, didn't add fire to the persecution of Domitian, but was written in Old Testament code that no Roman would understand. It's kind of like that mirrored in Daniel, where Daniel wrote, uh, when there was wrote on Belazar, when he, when he defiled the temple of God, drinking and having a party uh, with all the cups of the temple of God, wine, women, and song, mocking God, that the finger came out on the wall and wrote, Mene, Mene. Thy days are what? Numbered. You weighed in the balance and found wanton, and your days are numbered. That was written in Hebrew Aramaic. All the wise men did not know, by the way, Hebrew Aramaic. And when Daniel was called, he happened to know Hebrew Aramaic, and he read what was on the wall wasn't some great, great mystery. They just didn't speak it. They didn't know it. And when we talk about symbols in the book of Revelation, remember, they, they based themselves on memorizing most of the scripture because they had to. Because guess what? They didn't have a little Bible. And they have littler Bibles than this. They didn't have a cell phone with the Bible on it. They had scrolls. If they really wanted to know the scriptures, they memorized the scriptures. And so when you talked about symbols in the book of Revelation, there was no canonized New Testament that they understood the symbols. They understood the pattern of the symbols of the Old Testament. And so for a Jew, for a messenger, for a messenger, for a pastor that was pastoring a church who was a Jew, and most of them were at that time in the early church, they were interested all the symbols. For them, it was reading their own language. It was reading Bible. And for them, it became very clear what Jesus was talking about, or the Holy Spirit was talking about to the churches, because they understood it. For us, even though the most of them are clear here, we read right by the clarity of, of their own words that are written. For those that don't clarify themselves, we don't really take the time to look to the Old Testament to find out what they would mean. But they did. And the book was sealed up, or not sealed up, but sealed up to those that didn't believe. All the books in the Bible, by the way, are sealed up for those that don't believe. And the measure of your belief is the measure they're opened, by the way. The measure of your belief is the measure you'll face the brave new world. No pun on Huxley, 
But there is a brave new world. And like we said last week, only ca only what? The brave will really, really inherit it. You can go there, but the full inheritance goes to those that are cowards and unbelieving, and the two go hand in hand. We have to face, we live in a scary time. Pastor Steve was talking about the scary time. Time, You know what? Hallelujah. When did you not think that the Antichrist had to come before the second coming of Christ? This whole book reveals that. It is the, the fulfillment of Jesus Christ, but it is also the fulfillment of Satan and the fulfillment of his work. It is the finished work of God, but it also is the finish of Satan. And he comes down with great wrath, and he comes down with all he's got and spends it in the tribulation. You know what? And he is wiped out, like Luther would write in the great song, A Mighty Fortress. Who is he? Who can stand before him? One little stone, one little word will fell him. Right? right. One little word. Who is that one? And I love that song. He is the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. I pray when we study this book, we worship him like we never worshipped him before because we see him as he is. I pray we see him anew. I pray he's the fire of his eyes, which he saw then, will purge our own souls. And we'll be drawn like John was. But whenever you see God, when I got saved, you're on your knees. When I got saved, I fell to my knees. Did I see God? I saw him in my heart. I saw him in my mind. I saw him as much as I could see him without physically seeing him. And I was like a man dead. I pray that we be like dead men rising. I pray as we study this book, the fire of his eyes would burn out the dross that's within us. And we would confess him. And we'd proclaim him. Like we said last week in Second. Timothy chapter 4, that we'd feel the charge to proclaim Jesus Christ, the Word, who He is, is the Word of God. I hope you're looking forward to this study. I am to study it better and anew than I ever did before. And I pray it starts a revival in my soul and yours also. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you all. You're dismissed.